We know there are many choices in internet radio, and the staff and host of LA Talk Live would like to thank you for choosing the internet's hottest destination for the most eclectic sound and invigorating talk. This is LA Talk Live. We are more than just talk. Hi, and welcome to Mastermind Live with Susie Pruden on LA Talk Live, where we're more than just talk. And if you had been tuned in a little while ago and we disappeared, we don't know what happened, but the lights went out, the sound went off, everything. <laughs> it's a continuation probably of the earthquake from this morning. And um, But what's fun about today, besides the earthquake that woke us, many of us up oh, this yeah. morning, um, is... On Saturday, my guest for today canceled. And so Donna was going to send out a letter saying, we have a mystery guest for you. Well, we were, well because it was a mystery to us. And what happened is, it, we do have a mystery guest for you. Because I only met our guest literally two minutes before the show. <laughs> Her name is Onyx Monopoly. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And Onyx is going to be starting a show here on LA Talk Live next month on Mondays at 11. And so I know very little about you other than you're a motivational person mm -hmm. and that you want to support people in achieving their dreams, their desires, yes. their, their lives. So tell us about you and your journey and how it is that you've come to... I know you've just moved back to L.A., come yes. back to L.A., and now yes. you're here with L.A. Talk Live, and you also have a TV show, and you're <sighs> you're cooking. I'm, I'm trying. You know, yeah. it's, uh, I, I have to keep moving. I don't want to make this move in vain, coming from Utah, a very peaceful, smog free place, <laughs> to the lovely, busy L.A. Um, this is the land of the dreams, but uh, um, I'm here. On LA Talk Live, and as you mentioned before, I have a show coming up uh, called Hooked on Onyx, and that's uh, it's going to air April 7th, like you said, starting at 11 a.m. And I'm really excited about that because the, for the majority of my life, I've aspired to be someone like you, a, motion, a motivational speaker, thank you, someone that inspires people. And you know, my life it's, it has been very interesting, and there's been so many times in my life where I could have just given up. Uh, I know that one. Yes, right? And yeah. I wanted to give up. It's, every day is a constant battle. And, you know, I finally recently found my purpose, and I knew then that I was on the right track um, as far as being a motivational speaker. Um, I, I, uh, I I still stutter when I talk about it because I'm getting used to saying I am an alcoholic. I uh, battle with alcoholism, and I get really emotional about it. Yes, I would think so. Yes, because uh, it took a really big step for me to admit to people and to myself that it was a problem. Right, and it is. And when I own that, right, so many special things happen. Because when you own it, it doesn't it that the problem then is not the problem. Right, and then the fear. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. You know, I can't speak for all alcoholics, but many in the entertainment industry, I can speak for. Um, we have fears of what people will do, what they will do to you. And my whole life, you know, I've always tried to be honest about my past or the bad decisions I have made in my life. And once I owned up to my mistakes or any bad decision making I, I have had or done, you know, you, you feel free. You feel like yeah. the weight is lifted, the shackles are gone. And recently when I tackled that, that's a huge tackle. Oh, it is. You know, it took, I never picked up a drink. Uh, it was after my divorce and after 30. I picked up my first drink. And uh, the rest, in a sense, was downhill. You know, as a woman, a single mother with children, uh, you go from poor to rich to, in my eyes, almost super rich for myself to broke again overnight. And your world just crumbles. You, you don't you don't have no one to turn to because everyone that was around was around for money or for what you could do for them. The only thing you can turn to was the escape of reality for me. Yeah. And that escape was in the bottle. 
it was in the bottle and it was in the pills because you know and it was terrible and so when I tackled that and looked in the mirror I, I finally saw the banquet of life for myself and what I could do for others and so now what are you first of all let me ask I you I start crying Susie which is this you just got me crying out the gate <laughs> <laughs> we were supposed to be 30 you, you, minutes in before I shed it here you know it's so funny <laughs> Because I do guided imagery a, a lot when I do my uh, when I speak, uh-huh. and um, I I have people place their hand over their heart. Uh-huh. I, I work a lot with with women and weight, okay, and um, and addiction. Mm-hmm. And so I have the women sitting there with a hand on their heart saying, "I love you. Mm. I really really love you." And then right. I have them go on this inner journey. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, and and there's tears. Their eyes are closed, mm-hmm. and they're quiet because I'm the one talking and I go on this journey and I take them to the to their own essence Mm -hmm. and a lot of them cry Mm. and so someone said to me Susie why do people always cry when you do that (laughs) I said because they touch their soul Mm. wow see so when you go to that place that place that is so full of emotion Mm -hmm. that's your soul talking to you wow well loving yourself is something that I have I've learned recently just, it took me a while. I I yes. um I've been doing this particular work now. I started learning about self in the eighties. Mm. So I've been doing this work since the eighties. Wow. But when I first started, I came from a place of looking at myself in the mirror and just crying. Mm-hmm. You know, just hating myself so much. So I know the work that you're doing, mm-hmm. I know the journey that you're on mm-hmm. and it's different than my journey, but mm-hmm. it's still that journey right. of self-discovery, self-love, and you know, the decisions that we make, where we make st- stupid decisions, right. it's just like, oops, mm-hmm. and then get back on the horse, you so to speak. get back on the horse. Yeah. I mean, I ended up homeless, right. and that's after being on Oprah. That takes amazing talent Yes. <laughs> wow. You know. to do that, wow. but that was part of my journey. Wow. You know, there's a reason that we met, and I always say and I've said this before many times there are no accidents in life oh, and there's uh-uh. no accidents that I came in here to harass Richard <laughs> to have me do this show and I'm, I'm really grateful because I just I, I don't know if they can see you but I'm staring in your eyes and it's just you're so pure Thank you. And, and genuine and I'm not going to touch my soul right now in my inner <laughs> self because I'm not going to cry again. <laughs> crying is actually crying is good. I've done a lot of crying. Crying is good. <laughs> I'm a big cry baby, and my kids are crying. Baby. <laughs> Just got to work on that. But uh, self love is very important. And once I learned to love myself, I was I have been able to not only love myself better, but to love my children better. Yep. You know. Um, and you, when you love yourself, you open yourself up to love from others as well. Uh, yes. The more you love yourself, the more you open yourself to love from others. Well, how do you know? You know, that's a, a tricky one because you have people out here that do not know that they don't love themselves or they do not know that they have a wall up. I didn't know I had a wall up. I thought I loved everybody, including myself. Well, the problem is I did love everybody, but I didn't love myself. Yeah. I was... Um, I, I was hiding my insecurities through loving everyone else, you know, but how do you teach someone to love themselves who, if they're unaware that they don't have that problem? Well, I'm very lucky in that I'm a hypnotherapist. Mm-hmm. So I just hypnotize them. Well, you just hypnotize <laughs> me to find the right man. <laughs> and we'll <be> okay. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that. Actually, after I've done that. Really? Yeah, I have done that. But this is not about me. This is about you. Well, I need to find the right man. So if you okay. hypnotize me to stop making the wrong decisions with Ben. No, seriously, since we're talking about self-love, I have learned until you love yourself, you can't love anybody else. And that was why, that is why I kept loving the wrong man. They were feeling, I was holding on to something. Yeah. To fill a void of right. something that I right. was missing. But that was the wrong something. And that wrong something was also familiar with my abusive past as a child. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it wasn't until I was able to look in the mirror and say, I love you. You are beautiful. You are deserving. I, right now, I'm I, all jokes aside, I'm actually single and happy. But I do need to make sure that my eyes stay sober and clear because a sober mind have sober eyes. <laughs> and I want to make sure that I don't backtrack. You probably won't. You don't need to. No. You've been through the tunnel. You're on the other side. 
You don't have to go back there. You can look and go, oh, God, no, I don't think so. But what is your advice mm-hmm. to give me, to give other women as well that look up to me, n- you know, not to go back in that tunnel? Because I have traveled back in that tunnel, unfortunately, in the past. You know, if someone's going to go back, they're going to go back. Mm-hmm. So no matter how many times you tell them it's not a good idea, if they're going to go back, they're going to go back. So if you just focus on where they are now, mm-hmm. period, mm-hmm. and let the hope and and let them be where they are. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll tell somebody that's probably not a good decision. Mm-hmm. They'll either listen to me or not. Right. Now, I, again, as a hypnotherapist, I do a lot of work with addiction. Mm-hmm. And I really help people not go back or get out of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. But uh, tell us about your work. Well, now, well you have you have a, a TV show, and now you've got this radio TV show coming up next month, mm-hmm. and you're working with women. What do you, what is your work? To keep, I want to help men and women let go of the things and put down the things that God is telling them to put down. We have the tendency to hold on to things that God is telling us to put down and it's making our life pure hell. Mm -hmm. I want people, what I'm working on as well or um, motivating people to do is to move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, do not become a victim of your circumstances. You need to learn to live life and not let life live you. And, and it's also about the story you tell. Yes. Yes. And Lord knows I got a lot of stories to tell. So what I do in my work, Mm -hmm. when I have someone with a story Mm -hmm. who keeps telling me their story, Mm -hmm. I tell them to stop telling me their Mm -hmm. story. And I had one client say, I said, I invited her to one of my groups and I said, you can't tell your story. She looked at me and I said, well, you can tell it once. Mm -hmm. And then she said, who will I be if I can't tell my story? I said, that's what we want to find out Mm. because you're not your story. So exactly. Now, but do you feel that if we stop telling our story, that we'll get stuck? Um, Because me, when people ask me about my past, it triggers something to motivate me to keep moving forward. And this is why I am where I'm at through all the ups and downs. There comes a time. I mean, I I have a story. Mm -hmm. We all have stories. I use my story to motivate. Mm -hmm. Not to, I don't wear it like, poor me. Oh, yeah, the woes, it's me. So. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I use my story to motivate. And as um, very few people have been so stupid as I have and in my position admit my stupidity. Mm-hmm. So they say, my God, that's you? Mm-hmm. And I say, yeah, me. Uh-huh. And, and a lot of people hide their story right. from fear of being thought less, right. less than I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. My story is part of my power, right. but I wear it as that. It was, you wear it proudly. Yeah, I wear it as the greatest gift that could have been given. Right. I knew in the moment that I was going through losing everything, mm-hmm. and I looked down, and right. there was no net. Mm-hmm. I'd always had a net. I was born rich, right. and then I made a ton of money. Mm-hmm. Then I became very famous, mm-hmm. and I lost it all. Mm-hmm. And so I looked for the net, right. and there was no net. And I remember this so clearly. I said, thank you, God, for giving me this experience because it will change my life. Right. And the amazing thing about that statement was I meant it. Right. So when you look at your life mm-hmm. and all the adversity and all the trauma mm-hmm. and all the pain and agony and all that stuff that you went through, right. you could not do the work you do today without having gone through that. Amen. And that's the truth. I know. And, you know, when people ask me if you could change anything about your life, anything, what would you change? And I always pause, you know, a couple of things and people run through my head, but I wouldn't be where I am today. That's right. I wouldn't be able to help others if I change one thing. Yeah. You know, and, and so like yourself, I wouldn't change anything. I'm actually happy that I fell to the bottom of the bucket because I had the opportunity to stop fighting to get out. I laid there. I looked up. I came up with a strategy and I got off that bucket. You know, and and I will never go back to that crab bucket again. No, you don't need to. No. And, uh, you know, you see, because you did it. You can say, okay, check that one off. It's like we're these little soul beings. Right. Mm -hmm. I always think of us as being little soul beings. And when 
we're where we are when we're not here. Right. We had this little cubicle that we live in. Mm -hmm. And on the cubicle is a great big chart. Okay. And it has all the life lessons on it. Uh huh. And so we get each life, we get to go down and do some life lessons. Okay. And then we either achieve it or we don't achieve it. But when we do achieve it, mm -hmm. we can run back to our little cubicle as a little light being and put a gold star or a check mark mm -hmm. next to that life lesson. Right. So you did it. Now you can check it off and you don't have to do it again. Oh, amen. I won't be doing it again. You know, I know. Oh, oh, you you know what? Don't make me cry again. What's the next question? <laughs> so so tell us about your radio show. Oh, I'm so happy about that show. I'm really, really excited. Hooked on Onyx. Um, we're going to motivate and inspire people through experience and wisdom. I will have many guests on the show that have gone through adversity and superseded the dark parts in their life, the dark moments in their life. Um, I, my first show is about addiction. You know, I changed the topic when I opened up about alcoholism. Um, we will be touching on topics as molestation, um, psycho in love, just a lot of great topics that some people wouldn't dare to talk about or they, they want to script it and cut things out. No holds barred. We're just going in um, being pure and raw with emotion and human experience. And then I want to help people move forward from their mistakes. I want people to know that, yes, you might have jumped out of bushes and chased this man and, you know, you look really stupid. Well, we could change that. We could find a good man. I want people to know you might have been molested as a child, but that's not your fault. And that's not your future. And it's not your future. That's not who you are. That's right. You, you know what I mean? And you, just and you don't have to be embarrassed of your addiction. You know, if you're fighting it now and you're seeking help, that's not a bad thing. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to talk about it. Don't be ashamed to be who you are. And any and everyone is capable of success. There's so many things I can talk about, you know, um, in regards to what the show is about. But I'm just really excited, Susie, to share me and my weirdness and motivation with the world. You That's know. great. Are you working on a book? Everybody asks me that question. I've actually started writing several several times, and something drastic in my life will happen. I need to put a period the end and start another chat, another book too, or something. But the last book I had before I got it off burned up in my house fire. Um, and I wasn't writing it on the computer at that time. I was using a typewriter. <laughs> And so I understand. I used to, when I first started writing books, and that was in the 70s, my first book was published in 1972. Oh, I wasn't even thought of. You go, girl. And um, I would write it by hand, mm -hmm. and then I would type it, mm -hmm. and then I would literally cut and paste, mm. and I'd have all the papers on my living room floor, and scotch. Real cut and paste. Yeah, real cut and paste. Uh -huh. Scotch tape. Then I'd have to retype it. Oh, wow. And then I'd cut and paste again until I finally had the manuscript. And I would carry the manuscript like a baby. Right. <laughs> right. Because it felt like a baby. Right. It was, it was baby. my baby. Right. And uh, now it's easy. Now I just, um, I just, and I, now I have, um, I send it to the cloud. I, mean, I have carbonite. So <laughs> the other day I was worried about my computer. I went, oh, it's okay. It's it's saved. Everything is safe. You don't have to worry. Right. So that, as we speak right now, uh -huh. the computer doctor is at my office fixing my computer. You know, I'm, I'm, I guess I can't say old school, but to me, I'm old school. I still like writing. I like writing, handwriting letters. I still like taking my old notes. I like my post-its. Everybody keeps telling me to get on my computer. Yeah, let's do email, and I want it printed out so I can highlight it. So, you know, I just love having it in my hands physically. I, well, it, I will write a letter, but I will print it before I send it because I can find the mistakes more easily when mm -hmm. I look at it as as this way mm -hmm. then then on the, I, on the I can't screen. I can't see it on the computer so I'll print it out there's just yeah. so much more emotion in the handwriting to me well you're connected more to the left side of your brain when you're when you're writing which is mm -hmm. the subconscious mm -hmm. so for example when you're writing a wish list mm -hmm. if you type it it doesn't it doesn't, doesn't register doesn't register in the brain as mm -hmm. much as if you actually write it mm -hmm. and then when you read it out loud mm -hmm. then it really goes in deeper Oh, yeah. Well, I just I'll stick to the handwriting. I like being emotionally attached to everything. I don't know if that's my problem. Is There are no problems. There are only solutions. Amen. <laughs> yeah, we'll write that down. There are no problems. <laughs> there are only solutions. That is not an original Susie Pruden <laughs> statement. I, I look at my problems as opportunities. Mm -hmm. I don't like them. Right. 
But I figure if I've got that challenge coming up right now, whatever it is, then I'm being given an opportunity to access my creativity Mm -hmm. in a way that I have maybe not practiced before. Because I believe God only gives us, number one, what we can handle. Right, doesn't give you nothing. If it doesn't kill you, it'll It'll make make you you strong. strong. (laughs) That's right. I know. And um, I'm so strong. And... I also know that the the challenge that comes to me is an opportunity to take the next step. Right. That's true. That's so true. So you're coming back to L.A. Now, did you live here before? I did. I used to live here off and on six months here, six months in Utah. Um, Originally, um, I was born up north in California, but my family from the age of two, I was raised on an Air Force base in Utah. And um, to make a really long story short, I... uh, was I was shipped out here and ended up in foster care after being homeless for about a year at the age of 12. And so, therefore, I was raised in Inglewood. And um, after... How does somebody... Now, I know what it's like to be homeless at 45. Mm-hmm. I cannot, I cannot compute mm. homeless at 12. Well, it was hard. I'll bet it was hard. <laughs> That's an amazing story. And that's an important story because I don't think that those of us who have what we have can even compute that kind of um, uh, uh, of a terror. Yeah, I would say because I know how scared I was at forty-five. <laughs> you know what? Um, fear. I'm making you cry again. I I was trying to hide it, Susie. <laughs> I was trying to. You see me trying to dodge the camera. I'm like over here, like. <laughs> You know, eh, I have no regrets. I'm not even angry at nobody because of it anymore. I'm proud of myself. Yeah. You know, these are tears of joy. Yeah. You know, it's just this, the things I had to do to survive. I, I'm a, I, <laughs> it, it, rather than have it be a bio, biography, it could be a novel. <laughs> yeah, that part. Yeah, it could be a novel. You yeah. don't have to do, you know, talk about <laughs> stuff (laughs) but because I remember for myself behaviors that are so foreign to me today Uh uh-huh but saved my life at the time right yeah Yeah. I mean I have like I said I have no regrets um you know when you're being 12 when you're you know being 12 years old and in the streets and you're beautiful not to toot my horn but I was a very beautiful child you're still beautiful thank you you know beautiful adult thank you um I was just this you my whole life I don't think I knew what pure was because I was unfortunately engaged in sex from the age of two. So I knew how to have sex and perform sex um, since the age of two. So when I was in the street, I knew that in order for me to get what I want, at least this is how I felt, in order for me to get what I want, this is what I have to do. I was hungry. I was a, a girl menstruating. I needed to take care of myself. I was a clean child. And so I did what I had to do mm-hmm. to survive, mm-hmm. to eat, until I met um, a young gentleman who uh, at the time I was 12, he was 19. The first, was he the, fr- the first man that never laid a hand on me? Um, he taught me that my body is a temple and stop opening the doors to the cheapest or to the highest bidder. Right. Because I'm priceless. And I, I didn't understand what that meant until later in life. Do you still have contact with he, this person? He, no, unfortunately, a few years back, he committed suicide. He was actually a gay man and he was a virgin when he died. Um, because he was very, and I, I know this is probably going to be a little controversial in this statement, but he was God fearing and he did fear God and he felt the way he was raised. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And he fought back what his, his feelings for loving another man up until the point he couldn't take it. No yeah. More. Yeah. And he took his life because he just was that fearful of, you know, and I wish he could have still been here to see the world today and he would regardless I mean because we're not God we're it's not our place to judge anyone right you know we live our own life at the end of the day that's it's up to God no matter what we think and um, I just wish I could have had the opportunity to tell him your love regardless of who you are so write him a letter he's not here no write him a letter just write him a letter because he's not here right but he's also not gone. gone yes Write him a letter. He in, in his letter that he left his mother, he said to me, when you get to heaven, can you ask God 
to forgive me because I belong there too. Yeah. He's, he's already been forgiven. Just an amazing person. Yeah. This guy used to dumpster die for me. He's like, no, you're not going to go turn a trick. You know, when you're a prostitute, that's what you do. Yeah. I was 12. He said, you're not going to go do that. You're better than that. You're beautiful. You know, this is not what women were made for. And he would go dumpster dive and I go to jump in the trash to recycle. He taught me how he and my mother, who was homeless for the majority of her life, they taught me how to recycle. <laughs> and he would go get the cans and we would collect the things and he would go sell them and, and get me, excuse me, what I needed as a woman for that time of the month. He, there was times he would sit up all night so I could sleep. Just amazing, amazing person. And write him a letter. I'll write that letter. Write that letter. I'm gonna use your whole package. I know you are. Thing. I have This more. is why I said I don't want to talk about me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you see, I kept diverting it, kept turning it back on you. <laughs> Too late. So, Susan, tell me about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Too late. But this, the, the stories that you have, um, that's they're they're extraordinary. Yeah, you know, my attorney used to say, if I wasn't your attorney and I didn't know you and my friend said the same thing, I would think that you were lying. And, you know, I, I was so honest up until the point where I ended up dating somebody where I felt the need to protect myself. That's when I started lying and creating stuff. And my attorney said, you don't even have to create nothing. <laughs> you know, but it's unfortunately, my life has been very bizarre. Um, even I, I, I look at, I look back myself and say, it's, it's bizarre. Just, it's it's pretty bizarre. Yeah. You know. But it needs to be a book and it needs to be a novel form that will protect you. Okay. And you I'll, can use I'll a nom de plume. You can use a nom de plume. Okay. Uh, you don't have to use your own name. My sister yeah. has four nom four names that are not hers that she writes into four different genres. Mm-hmm. And none of them are her name. You know, I don't even care anymore um if it's my name or not. You know, I spent so many years, especially the last 3 hiding and trying to protect what I thought was a brand and that's not who I am you know I had a a gentleman I dated his mother would you know she was blackmailing me for whatever the reason I know the reason but um she said you know we're gonna put a YouTube video up of you drunk because I didn't know that her son in which I was dating at the time was taking videos of me drunk um and they were just we're gonna let everybody know you do this and that and you know does everybody know that you do this and that and I got to the point when I'm laying up in the hospital fighting for my life because I won't give this woman money. And I just said, yeah, I can't curse, but I, you know what? F it. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to put out a video of my damn self. My name is Onyx. I'm an alcoholic. I used to be a prostitute. <laughs> I've been broke, rich. I lived in a big mansion. I went from the Centurion card to the EBT card. I can't loan you no money. Stop calling my damn phone. My credit sucks. It was just like everything. I just took the power away. And, and it's like, now, what do you what do you have left? Exactly. What do you have left? Okay, and the baby might not be your son's. What you got left? What do you have left? And you know what? I had so much peace. Mm-hmm. I was able to sleep. Mm-hmm. And you know what, Susie? But she wasn't very happy about that. No, because the bitch probably, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She probably wanted to make some money when I got on Oprah like you. <laughs> you know? But you know what? This is my story to tell. It's not no one else's. No. Uh-uh. It's not yours. And you, you can tell it any way you choose to tell right. it. Right. You know what? And just for jokes, I might add a little more crazy on top of it. Sure. You know, just for kicks and laugh. But, you know, it's been so crazy. And it's just my story. Yes, I used to drive down the street just seeing who he was dating. Just, you know, I've had a very strange life. And one thing about Onyx, I love and I love hard. I give you all I got. So when you take that and slap me in the face with it and just step on it, you know, it's just really, yeah, I, you know, it not only does it hurt, but you just, you, before I, I wanted revenge, but that's not my place. Their dharma is their karma. And I'm going to let karma cause she's a scorned woman. Hell have no fury like karma. No, was no, 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 you know, no. so I've just let it go because it takes so much energy, it takes too much energy, you know, and it makes you sick. It's not. Yeah. I, I don't want it, Susie. They can have it. Yeah. You, and they can every, yeah. all those little things. They can keep it. I want peace. I want happiness. Well, you you want to make a difference. And I, yes, I want other women and children, boys and girls, to know that no matter what you've gone through or even what you're going through, you could turn it around. Yeah. You know, uh, you can. And and so much, even as adults, we've gone through so much, and we we sometimes sometimes it's our fault, but there are times it's not our fault. 
so many of us are born with single mothers or single fathers. They, they can't teach us how to be a woman or how to be a man. If it's a man, you can't teach your daughter how to grow into a woman. You can love her to death and teach her how a man's supposed to treat a woman, but you can never teach her how to be a woman. A mother, you have a son. You could teach him how to treat a woman and how to respect a woman, but you could never teach him how to be a man. So it's not their fault yep. when they have no knowledge of yeah. how, you know what I mean, how they're supposed to be. Or if you've been in situations where somebody hurt you as a child, it's not your fault. You know, because me, uh, for, for myself, I carried that up into my 30s, yeah. thinking it was my fault. My a fault. lot of people do. Yeah. A lot of people blame themselves for whatever happened to their family when they were um, when they were children. Children, yes. And I have a friend who's... Um, who went through a terrible situation with her parents and blamed herself for years until one day she finally woke up and said, wait, hold it. Mm -hmm. I'm ruining my life right. now because of what happened then, thinking it was my fault. Right. And so now do you work with people one-on-one -on -one or do you work with groups? Uh, both. I have, oh my gosh, um, I have a, a decent social media following. Um, and... I Skype people. I go back and forth through it, direct messages. Um, sometimes I call them on the phone and and help them. They and it's very humbling to me when people say I inspire them. Yeah, you know, and it's just how. So how do people reach you? They reach me through Facebook. You under Onyx Monopoly or um, Onyx, but you can find me anywhere if you put in Onyx O N Y X X Monopoly. Double X. Yeah, two X's. Yes, you can reach me anywhere. Um, I would like them to I'd rather them come on the show because it's becoming overwhelming um, to respond to everyone. So do you charge? Um, I have in the past for other businesses. This is something new for me. So you need to create a system so that you can <coughs> excuse me, sell packages on how you help people. Yes. And I can help you with that. Oh, that would be I great. know how to do that. I bet. Uh huh. I'm very good at it. I make a lot of money. <laughs> I helped somebody today. This was really fun. She just got an idea like two days ago of what she wants to do with her life. Uh -huh. And um, as she started talking, and I said, because my mind works in, um, as soon as someone tells me something, it start, I, I start firing off ideas. Mm -hmm. And she uh, wants to work with widows because she, she, she didn't know she was doing this. She already has a group. Mm -hmm. And because she wants to work with people to help them overcome their grief and get on with their lives. Mm -hmm. So I immediately saw it a whole business. Mm -hmm. And then I saw it as a business in a box. And then I saw it as you could license this business. And I'm going on and on and on. And then I said, now, when I met her, I met her at a conference that was called Legacy. Okay. Leaving a Legacy. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, so-and-so, this is your legacy. She goes, oh, my God, you're right. It was wonderful. Right. Then I did the hypnosis. Okay. Now, I have a lot of templates, mm -hmm. but this I did totally ad lib. Oh. I know no template at all. And at one point, I felt the a touch on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And it was in, 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 in the hypnosis said, you have been touched, because I felt it, mm -hmm. by the hand of God. Mm -hmm. And so, talk about crying at the end of the hypnosis. I didn't know thank you. So, <laughs> that was so sweet. I said, I want you to know that that was totally channeled. I had nothing to do with it. I cannot remember, mm. except for the touch. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what I said, but this is your legacy. Yeah. And so, your legacy is taking all that pain that you went through mm -hmm. and all that insanity. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. You've got to be insane to go through that. Mm -hmm. When I think of the stuff that I've in, it had to be insane. And you take it now, and it's your legacy. You'll use that as your vehicle right. to change, help people change their lives. Because a lot of people seriously don't know how right. to get out of the hole. Right. And they don't know that they don't know. Right. Right. So with your, your TV show, what is that? Um, Hooked on Onyx Lifestyles of the Wise and Wealthy. It's a modern day lifestyles of the rich and famous. Um, but instead of focusing on the assets, the materialistic assets of the individual, 
we focus on the individual, the spirit of the individual. We want to know what inspires them to wake up every day. How did they accumulate all this money? Um, if it was inherited, what drives them to keep the family business going? You know, things like that. And um, to have them give advice to the um, the average person to, to accumulate this money or go into business and become just as successful. Because many of the people that I have on my list to interview, uh, many of them actually have been homeless before or they've fallen broke, you know, um, without anything. And they've rebuilt mm -hmm. their empire. So, you know, the focal point is the individual um, and their spirit instead of their Bugattis and mansions. Mm -hmm. Although that's nice. Um, I mean, but we I'm so tired of seeing that sex, drugs and fast cars. Yeah. You know, I, I OK, well, I don't want your drugs. Maybe a little sex and I'll take the fast car. But how do I get my money to buy it so I don't have to get it on credit? Right. You know, and how do um, you know you have a lot of these entrepreneurs or business owners that are successfully married? Yes. Long term. How do I make money and remain happily married? Takes work. Yes, it does. And uh, that's and on both sides. Yes. Yes. And a willingness to work on both sides. Yes. Yes. And how do you yeah. avoid the gold diggers? You know what I mean? Because you and how do you avoid the temptation? So those are things that we'll be talking about on that show. It's in production right now. It's going to be a syndicated web series because I want to keep all my money. So when the networks come a knocking, I, I can call my own shots. That's nice. Yeah. Good for you. Thank you. So what else is on your plate? You've got the radio show coming up next month. You've got mm -hmm. the TV show coming up. Even though you're kicking and screaming, you are going to write a book. Yeah, I'm going. I, I can actually help you with that because I've done 14, and oh well, yes. you know, I've just finished. I guess my 14th book. Okay. And it's off to the publisher now. And um, I have an event else? coming up. Oh, good. We Tell us about that. We were going to do a uh, pre-launch for the radio show, but unfortunately, um, because of scheduling, I'm going to do a post-launch at the Saban Theater in Beverly Hills. Um, I'm going to have a formal red carpet event. Um, with about 400 guests uh, for the post-launch celebration of the Hooked on Onyx show. Excellent. So this is really special to me. This is like Do you a have a date? Um, April 11th. I'm sorry, I didn't say that, did I? April 11th. But that's not open. It's not. It's um, invite only. It's a private party. Yeah, it is. Excellent. Yeah, but that's just huge for me. You know. Well, that would be huge for anybody. Yeah, we'll be honoring a couple of celebrities that have been um, in sobriety for quite some time consistently, um, and as well as a couple that are going through it. You know, and so it's it's really special to me this this whole thing because it's you know as a little girl and you think of these things and you dream about it and people tell you yeah right to see it unfolding it's like wow making it happen oh yes the law of attraction baby you know, yeah you can't tell me when someone tells when someone says to me yeah right or it's not gonna happen I'm one woman with many possibilities I will move the heavens and the earth the mountains right. the lakes and the rivers to prove you wrong that's just you just don't tell me no. You know. Yeah, the last t my mother told me I couldn't date the boy I was dating when I was 19, so I married him. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Did it pan out? Did it work out? We were married 18 years. Oh, okay, that's a good. We one. have a great son together. I have two grandsons, and um, we created me, my Susie Pruden, the persona. Oh, okay. So yes, and with the stuff that wasn't good, yes. Are you friends now? Nope. No. 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 Even friends no. now? Nope. Oh well. I'm kind of no. sort of friends with my ex-husband. No. Unless don't. I ask him for money. I just don't ask him for money. <laughs> well, I paid I paid my husband. So oh, it sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so. I had to pay alimony for three years. Yeah. Uh, alimony I didn't have to pay. I just gave him half of everything I had. And so, a house and a house in East Hampton. Doesn't sometimes, <laughs> isn't it better to pay him to go away? That's why I did it. Yeah, that part. It's just like, here, go away. Yeah. Uh, my, lawyer said, my lawyer said, you can fight this mm -hmm. and win. Mm -hmm. said, how long will it take? He said, five years. five years. I said, the attorneys get all the money. Yeah. I said, pay him half of everything I have. Mm -hmm. Give him the house. I'm out of here. Oh, yeah. And he took it. Yeah. And ran. Yeah. Was, was your child grown at the time? He was 14. So did you have yeah. to pay child support or was it a joint thing? Well, it was supposed to. It's a story. Oh, okay. It's a story. I wanted to hear it. <laughs> I want to say well, I, I want to see if your divorce was just intriguing as mine. Well, it it, uh, it no, there was no child support. Um, my son lived most of the time with me, and then I sent him to boarding school. My husband was supposed to pay half of everything, mm -hmm. and after I sent my son to boarding school, which my ex husband didn't agree with, he stopped paying every anything. Mm -hmm. So basically, it just you washing your hands. Yeah, just and my son has n my 
ex-husband does not know his grandchildren who are 14 and 16. That's unfortunate. No, it's not. Oh, okay. No. Well, you know him better than I yeah. do. Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, but that's sad for the children that he, whatever, I, I don't know the guy, but for whatever reasons, his selfish needs or whatever the case may be, it's just sad because these children don't have the opportunity to see their biological grandfather. They will when they're 18, their father told them. Oh, wow. So your son also has, he's upset with his grandfather or his father. I'm sorry. Yeah, he hasn't spoken to him in about 17 years. Wow. So, I mean, you teach people to let go. Is it in your, do you feel? My you son is much safer not talking to his father. Oh, wow. Well, you know better than I do. You know what? And sometimes you it's know, better that way. Some, th there are certain instances it is important to let go. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with something that is as dangerous mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. this is. It's beneficial to. You are much safer to um, see the reality of it. Right. And just. So w with your son, I'm, I, and I just, this is, it. It's familiar with something I'm going through. With your son, has he let go of the anger, but he knows what's in the best interest? So he's not angry, but he's, he, he just chooses not to deal with it? Uh, I don't know. There are certain things that he's he's more numb mm -hmm. about it than mm -hmm. angry. Okay. And he would just prefer to... Just not even talk about it. Yeah, we don't talk about it. Occasionally, it'll come up and we both go, uh-huh. I remember, uh-huh, I remember, and then it's done. So it doesn't get to him. No, he's got too much going on for him. He's got two unbelievably beautiful children, mm -hmm. and um, he's an artist. Okay. And so he's focused on that. Mm -hmm. He's in a new relationship, so he's focused on that, and uh, that's driving him crazy. But <laughs> <laughs> What would your advice be for people that are going through situations like that for example, when you know something is toxic and it's not going to change, you're dealing with people who are not going to change. They're set in their ways. And every time you go around them or deal with them or communicate, it's just toxic drama, negativity. So you choose to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. But although we as individuals choose to leave that situation alone and not deal with it, we still harbor pain. Even if we're numb in the back of our subconscious mind, we're, we're like, you, you know, you're frustrated. It's, it's time. It takes time. Mm -hmm. I used to be very angry for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then I started to, I started to, when I started to do the work on myself, uh -huh. I really started to work on my anger mm -hmm. and uh, my, my rage. It was yes. rage. Yes. And so I, um, I don't have any feelings at all anymore about mm -hmm. it. It just, it is what it was. Right. You just or let it go and let, let it, it go. Put it in a box and just, or did you not even put it in a box? I didn't even put it in a box. It's just hanging it out there someplace. Right. You know, it's just what. It was part of the journey that got me here. How do we remain consistent when we look? Because I'm someone who I would say had a bad temper, especially when I was hurt. My mouth was just the most vicious thing. Words can, uh, to me, words are so much deeper than a, a, a physical. Oh, hit, I, oh, yeah. You know, and I was, vi when you hurt me, I'm, I'm coming after you verbally. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, and so, and I had so much anger and rage and I had pain of my own that I had carried on throughout the years and I was deflecting it onto the individual I was trying to hurt that hurt me because there's something about the situation currently that I was living in that reminded me of something in my past. Yeah. So when we decide to move on and let it go, many of us think we let it go. We, we well, we it's, a it go. Mm -hmm. it's a practice. It's a practice because it'll keep showing up. Yes, exactly. So it's a practice to move through it without destroying the person you're talking to. Right. And and that's a huge practice because words are, words can kill. Right. They can. Uh, yeah. And words can damage. And you have to be very, very careful how you use your words, what words you use. I mean, I have a temper. I've said things to people, I, and I, I, I've gone, I don't believe I just said that. Right. You and know. you can't take it back. No. Right. No, you can't take and it back. And sometimes they're just so hurt, it's hard for them to forgive you, even though they might say, I forgive you. They don't, because in the back of their mind, it still hurts. Yeah. I believe when you're angry um, or drunk, thank God I don't drink anymore, but I believe you tell the truth. I, I really do. Um, or I, And I've said some things that I meant at that time. Um, did I feel like that completely? No, but at that moment in time, I meant it. But I, I, I wholeheartedly, for the most part, believe when you say things when you're angry, that is how you feel. It's something that you've been holding on and you just decide to just throw it all out there. 
because you want to hurt that person and you you just want to let them know you feel the place to get to is to not want to hurt somebody right that's the place to get to and the place to get to is not to let people take you there or to um you you have to know that they can't take you there mm-hmm. unless you let you them. go mm-hmm. so your practice is to not go mm-hmm. and it's very hard it's a challenge yes it's it's a, a challenge. Big challenge it's a practice and i use that word it's a huge word mm-hmm. because things can trigger us but it's a practice it's, it's a practice on how we allow that to happen right and so you it's just a practice right. notice it and then just say mm, don't think i'm gonna do that right thanks a lot of strength you know yep you you have to have begun the healing process before you could, i mean because it's just it's it's really hard i don't see someone who's not ready or not in the healing process having the capability of not going there and the enemy is very busy when you're trying to change and move forward it finds little things and side curve balls and well i sometimes notice my mind with starting with stories with people that i'm angry at mm-hmm. and the, the chatter starts yeah and i'll go excuse me <laughs> do you have to have this conversation all right <laughs> <laughs> and then right. you just stop the conversation yes i told someone yesterday i said the ve- the best um offense or defense for argument is silence yeah because you can't argue with yourself no you know and then you don't say anything you don't mean you or or you think you don't mean or you and you won't say anything you feel you need to take back and you don't hurt this person and they don't have to especially especially when dealing with children you know oh especially when children children. are innocent they are they're they're very innocent and unfortunately today there are very few innocent children because so many people have taken that away from them that's something i want to help restore um and children for today and moving forward but you know when i was telling this young lady yesterday it was an incident with ch- children involved the children were crying and the girl was showing herself like showing her complete uh, she was just a hot mess and i told her i said you know what? everything you're doing now these kids are going to lay down tonight and the last thing they see is this vision and i said when they wake up in the morning all of that energy the first thing they're going to think of is this and i said and then 30 years from now you don't know how this is going to affect them and it's just not right did so, this person hear you? No, I was talking directly to her. Not talking to her and having her she hear. She started crying. I felt because she she opened up about you know her anger. Um, I, I I felt that she she heard me and she apologized. I felt she was sincere. You know, unfortunately, this young lady has a lot of pain. She has a past similar to mine. Um, she cannot have children, so she was angry about a situation with a stepchild. Um, and it's just it was I, I was saddened by her story and to hear her but she has a lot of anger and i hope that she meant when she said when she said she wanted to change you know um because it doesn't happen in that moment there's no way she could have changed right in that no. moment you know um but you just you have to watch your words and it's it's you, frustrating for me because you know it's i i deal with it myself every day as a constant battle when i'm dealing with you know the my children's father or, or just individuals um especially takers you know, and or people calling you out of the blue you haven't spoke to in years and they ask you for money and then you just want to scream and yell. And, you know, it's a constant battle every day. So, you know, that's why I ask you what is the advice to keep us in that zone? Because me, I, I'm, I think I'm a little further along than most. It's, it's, a, it's a, as again, it's a practice. Right. And when people ask you for money, you say, not at this time. I just tell them I don't loan family and friends money anymore. Yeah. You know, it's if we don't have a deal on the table and there's no contract, you know, I'm not investing. Well, can you invest in helping me get an apartment? No. What is the return on that? Right. Uh, an eviction? A ding on my credit? No, thank you. So, you know, and I ain't got none to give. Everything I have is going into my children and my career, you know, my children's future. But there's just things that, you know, I deal with. Mine are more minute now because I've eliminated all the drama and the people with the drama. All I have to talk about is my story now and moving forward. I find that having eliminated the drama mm-hmm. in my life has made it so much easier. Mm-hmm. A lot of people around me have drama, and I watch it, and I go, okay. Just grab a bag of popcorn. That's what I'm starting. I said, <laughs> I'm, gonna get, I'm going to get situated in my house, and I don't, we don't watch TV. I, like, I'm, I love having my children read, and if I want to catch up on some episodes or see what the heck's going on on TV, I go on YouTube or whatever. But I'm going to start popping a bag of popcorn and watching everybody their drawn-out drama. You know, it's just ridiculous. And I'm, I, I sit back, I'm like, wow, that was me. Yeah. 
You know, that was me. Yeah. I, I know people have got gained so much weight with bonbons and popcorns to sit back and watch my drama. I should have won an Emmy and an Oscar and everything else with all the bull crap I was going through. But was I it? attracted that. Yes, we do. Yeah. I, there was something about me that attracted drama and I was self-sabotaging. Yep. Unfortunately. I was scared of my success because I was afraid of who would use me in the process or if I ended up with someone again would they would they use me what do they want from me do they love me for me so I would find ways um unconsciously to sabotage myself and a couple of my colleagues said you know you are a self-sabotager you're afraid. a lot of people do that when they're afraid yeah and um but right now you're moving into a really really good place. oh yes I'm that stuff is so far behind me Susie I, I there's no going back no. I don't drive in reverse. I, I did for a while, <laughs> but I don't know about you. I do not put my car in reverse when I'm trying to move forward. Well, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's, you start crashing into things. No, it's like ride clothes. the horse in the direction Just, in the direction it's going. Uh, right. You yeah. Know? Uh -uh. And I you're going to make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. And when you get angry, just notice it. And just go, well, I get, I get angry. Mm -hmm. And I will tell the people that work with me in, in my company, I said, I am in a terrible, terrible mood. Mm -hmm. I am angry. I do not know exactly why, but I am rageful. It has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, I'll just from on my own. Mm -hmm. My sister was funny. She said, whenever you, we would share an apartment for a while. Okay. And she said, whenever you'd come out of your room and say, I'm in a bad mood, she said, I would just disappear. Right. You know, because she just said, and, and she was right, because mm -hmm. it, it had nothing to do with her. Right. Because we do go through emotions. Right. So we have to honor them and then release them. What I've learned to do is walk away. And I used to tell my ex-husband, I said, now we talked to the pastor and we agreed that we're going to walk away. So why are you chasing me and I'm trying to walk away? <laughs> Let me calm down because I'm going to say something and your feelings are going to get hurt and I'm going to be the bad guy. So I, I've honestly, I've learned to walk away. Yeah. You know, even with my children. I have five-year-old twins, and my daughter and my ex-husband came in, and they asked the twins, well, where's mom? Mommy put herself on a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> the twins upset me so bad, and I said, if I, I'm going to hurt you, you know, go in there, and you sit down on timeout, and I'm going to take a timeout, and they were confused. You're going to take a time. Mommy needs a timeout. You just go in there, and I just had to go in the other room and just start writing. Oh, but and, that's you wonderful. Know, you know, so I take timeouts. You know, for me, it works. That's wonderful. Yeah. So if you have, if you want to take away something from today, take <laughs> away, take a time out. Take a time out. Take Meditate. Take a time out. Just breathe. You yeah. Know? And before, unfortunately, when I got really stressed out, it was a few years that this alcoholism kicked in. I would drink. You oh, know? yeah. And now it's just, you know, I reincorporated my meditation and reincorporated my timeouts. And I don't even have the urge to drink anymore. No, it goes it's away. Just, like I just and I've, I'm, I'm newly I'm new to the sobriety. Like it's all I'm what 14 days in. Um, but I really I've, I've gone out, stood next to bottles of alcohol. People have asked me and it felt so good to say I don't drink. Yeah. You know, and if I do um, get tempted, I take a time out. I really do walk away from the situation. Um, because I don't want to move backwards. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that. I'll t I need a timeout. Oh, yeah. I will use that. In the future. But I feel myself mm -hmm. getting. Susie upset. needs a timeout. So I need a timeout. I'm just gonna sit in the other room right by myself right, right now. Right, and just tell them do not enter. And then when I deal with people that want to bring their drama into my life, I'm learning daily to not entertain it. Your drama is your drama. Mm -hmm. I don't need it. I have had enough of my own. Return to sender in the name of Jesus. Just take it back. I just, just re take your drama and go that way. Turn around. You turn. I just don't want it because it's no. so draining. I've had to deal with my own. I've always been a person trying to fix other people's problems. And then it becomes my problem. And then if I make promises to help them out financially and something happens in my life where I can't, I'm the bad guy. So now that drama has drained me emotionally, financially, physically. No, not only do I need a physical timeout, I need a mental timeout. Just no, I'm just not going to do it, Susie. That's smart. Yeah, you just can't. Yeah. So I also have a, a rule at my office that you can't bring your drama into the office. Or into you, the house. Well, uh, no, I don't think anybody's brought drama into my house recently, but occasionally they'll bring drama into my office. I say, leave the drama by the door. Right. When you walk into this office, the drama's outside. It's outside. Right. Because we got enough drama in here right. handling the business. We, exactly. We, um, 
we uh, don't don't need any more. And then, right. and and for the most part, you know, it's it's pretty good. I'm working on that with my children because you know when I was sick, unfortunately, they had to stay with their grandmother for a little while. They were angry, angry at each other. Um, the lifestyles are different. The way I raise them, the way Granny raises them. And they're just, I find them arguing and yelling at each other and screaming at each other. And I said, we're not going to do this. And, but I'll do <laughs> I just have all these creative tactics for my children. Well, that's wonderful. You that's know. wonderful. We've it, got one minute left. Oh, okay. So tell me one creative thing that you do with your kids so that you can guide them in a, in a way that's really supportive. I make them tell each other they love each other. That I, I make them hug each other, and I, I make them tell each other that they love each other. And I teach them that you only, I tell my daughter, you only have four brothers. I tell my sons, you only have um, three sisters. And if, or, you know, or in the village, you only have one angel, you only have one Chrissy. If they were gone today, you can't bring her back. Right. So it's not worth fighting. Love her. Hug her. And tell her you love her. You know, that's what I do for my children. And so they, they'll go through their little tantrums, and then they feel bad, and I love you, and you know, so I just embrace love with them. I love watching my grandsons because they have a real what they have fought. Of course, kids mm -hmm. do fight. Yeah, they fight, but for the most part, they um they play game. They're four di four years difference, mm -hmm. and they play chess together. They they are yes. they have a beautiful beautiful. I was looking at them the other night. They were watching television, and the little one. They're not so little. He's right. tall as tall as I am. Had his head on the older one's shoulder, and mm -hmm. they just watching a movie together right. and it just was so it's so beautiful it's so, so beautiful to no see. arguing no fight just pure love and mm -hmm. that's what i'm teaching my children again because you know i was in a hospital for almost a year and the the lifestyle changed for them and the way we do things and i just teach them love each other you know love each other love ourselves yes and play together i make my daughter my daughter that's at home she'll be 14 this month she gets so irritated she is just i i don't think she's a teenager she might not have no kids she's just like i don't like kids but i said you know what you have to play with your brothers before you can go hang out with your friends you know i don't do it every day but when we're together and uh, I, w I have family days where you play with your brother we do things as a family together no friends and they go mom were you gonna turn off your phone no work you know i'm like all right deal <laughs> <laughs> they got your number. Yes, they have my number. They can't take when it's family day and family time. I have to promise I turn off my phone. Good. Yeah, and that's a no. Nope, How many kids do you have? Seven. Wow. Yeah, my two oldest are adopted, and then I have five: fourteen, uh, eleven, five-year-old twins, and one. Good for you. Yeah, I've been busy. You've been busy. Yeah, I've, I thought I was gonna have eleven. I wanted to marry one man be with them for the rest of my life, have 11 children and teach them the family business and have it go on for generations. Well, you can still teach your kids the family business because you're creating a whole new business. Yeah. It's just like I was telling my client today when she realized that what she was going to do was a legacy. Right. And what you're doing is creating a legacy. Yes. For motivation. I want my children to stay innocent and teach others, um, yeah. you know, to teach, you know, as they grow older. I want them to teach their children and other people the children are innocent and you know, the name of my book, and I know we have to wrap up, was, you know, um, I've changed a couple times. Mommy, why'd you let them break my wings and snatch my halo? And now, um, whenever I do come out with it, is fractured rings and a broken halo. Because I was an angel, I felt, a as a child. And I felt someone took that away. So you tripped as a child. I tripped. And yeah. Got up, back, dusted off. Dusted off, and now you're back. Yeah. Um, doing what you're meant to do. I, I believe that. Yeah. There, uh, as you said earlier, there are no accidents. There, there definitely, there's nothing. This, all, no. everything that I've gone through will, will not have happened, uh, in vain. So one more time, so that people can really, I, I think that what you want to do and the fact that you've been doing it, gratis has to change, mm -hmm. and that you have a, a duty to yourself. Yes, I do. To make this a business. And it's right to be a business. I mean, when I look at the business that I have, the lives that I've changed, the people that I've helped, and I make a lot of money doing it, and um, I give a lot of money. I also tithe my time. Mm -hmm. But you need to be, what you want to do is extremely worthwhile, extremely important, and people value it more when they pay for it. Yes, they do. And you have skin in the game. Yep. They value it more when they pay for it. Yeah. So I want to thank you for joining us. Yes. Please tune in to Hooked on Onyx. Yes. Mondays um, at 7, starting April 7th. Mondays at 11. What did I say? 7. Oh.
Mondays at 11, starting April 7th. There we go. There you go. Mondays at 11, starting April April 7th. 7th. See? (laughs) I know. That's hard. 7-11. So, anyway, it's been fun talking with you. Again, I'm Susie Pruden. This is Mastermind Live with Susie Pruden on LA Talk Live, where we're more than just Talk. talk. Yeah.